I'd like to thank our sponsors, Halo Eclipse Spectacles, for this episode. Halo created the most stylish and safe viewing glasses for the upcoming solar eclipses in October 2023, April 2024, and beyond. No doubt some of you remember the great American eclipse of 2017 and possibly sat in traffic for hours searching for the path of totality. This is where the moon crosses in front of the sun, casting a shadow on the earth that turns day into night for up to two to three minutes. At that time, many eclipse chasers only had flimsy paper glasses with questionable safety ratings. Leah Brooke created Halo for the 2017 solar eclipse. She believed that this monumental event should be celebrated with safe, durable, and chic glasses to create memories as inspiring as the eclipse itself. And to ensure that everyone's eyes stay protected and beautiful, Halo performs rigorous testing beyond international safety standards and is recommended by the American Astronomical Society as a preferred solar viewer vendor. It excited me to learn that there are two solar eclipses each year between 2023 and 2028, so you can use these beautiful high-quality glasses for years to come. For more information on the eclipse dates and paths, you can go to www.haloeclipse.com. Halo is offering listeners of Gateways to Awakening 20% off using the code AWAKENING20, which will also be in the show notes. The last clips, Halo sold out early, so make sure to place your orders soon. Hi, my name is Yasmin Tarehi, and this is Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and consciousness. Today's episode is about the search for extraterrestrial life with Avi Loeb. He's the Frank B. Baird Professor of Science at Harvard University. He's a best-selling author and has been in the list of the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Publishers Weekly, and so many more. He's the author of the book, Extra Terrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, and the book, Interstellar. Avi is the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation within the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. He also serves as the head of the Galileo Project, and he had been the longest serving chair of Harvard's Department of Astronomy and the founding director of Harvard's Black Hole Initiative. So I could go on and on. <laughs> His bio is, is quite fascinating. But uh, Well, for- uh, we, we, we can save a lot of time if you just refer to me as a farm boy. Uh, <laughs> I was born on a farm and that pretty much shaped my career. Uh, so, so tell us more about that. How did that shape your perspective? Well, um, first I became connected to nature much more than to people. I used to go to the hills of the village where I was born and read philosophy books. And um, I used to collect eggs every afternoon. So I was very much uh, in sync with nature. And that's pretty much where I am right now. And it's just that I extended the, the definition of nature to include the universe as a whole. Uh, So not just the nature that we find on the two-dimensional surface of the Earth, this rock that we were born on, but exploring also the third dimension, far away, because there is much more to see out there, and the universe is too vast for us to ignore it. Uh, One thing that you may have noticed, there was an image of the Earth taken by the Orion uh, spacecraft, uh, and the you couldn't tell where the border between Ukraine and Russia is. Uh, Nevertheless, if you open the morning newspaper, you will find most of the discussion about that border. And from space, it's completely invisible. Very little uh, is being discussed from the perspective of space. And uh, exploring space changes uh, our uh, view about what is important in life. So, Uh, Early on in my life, I became connected to nature and never stopped thinking about uh, nature in the grandest uh, uh, scheme, uh, on the biggest uh, stage that we are at. And and the one message, if I had to summarize my career as an uh, astrophysicist, I would say that the biggest message I received is that of um, humility, that we should 
keep a sense of cosmic modesty because we know that we are not at the center of the stage. The Earth moves around the Sun and the Sun moves around the center of the Milky Way galaxy and the Milky Way galaxy is one out of a trillion galaxies within the observable volume of the universe and there might be many more outside the region that we can see and so altogether we are not at the center of the stage and then moreover uh, we just arrived at the end the the human species uh, existed for a few million years and the universe existed for 13.8 billion years since the big bang so if you arrive to a play at the end of the play, and you are not at the center of the stage, the play is not about you. <laughs> uh, that's a simple conclusion. However, you know, we keep forgetting that. We are obsessed with what happens on Earth. My colleagues in academia are obsessed with the thought that we are the smartest in the universe. We should just discuss dead objects in the form of stars, planets, dark matter, objects that have no life, as if the universe is completely dead except for us. And that's, to me, a very strange proposition. I would think that, you know, we are one student in a class of intelligent civilizations. That's the easiest uh, thing to to imagine because um, we know that uh, a substantial fraction of all the sun-like stars have a planet like the Earth. And and we also know that most of the sun-like stars formed billions of years before the sun. So, so very likely, uh, you know, we are not even the brightest student in the class. <laughs> and um, so a sense of modesty, this is really a summary of my scientific career that followed my, me growing up on a farm. And um, the other thing I learned is uh, not to pay attention too much to what other people say. And basically um, think about the big questions um, and not um, try to get as many likes as possible. I actually have no footprint on social media. Um, Because if you look at the history of physics on many occasions, you know, nature was our tutor. It it was our teacher. Uh, We uncovered through uh, experiments evidence for things that we've never imagined. And uh, we were wrong in so many ways, you know. Just to give you an example, uh, in uh, between 1935 and 1939, Albert Einstein, uh, just a couple of years after he arrived to uh, the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, he made three major mistakes in three independent papers. He argued that quantum mechanics uh, doesn't have entanglement, doesn't have what he called spooky action at a distance in one paper. And then in another paper, he argued that gravitational waves do not exist. And then in a third paper, he argued that black holes do not exist. Now, over the past five years, just the past five years, about eight decades later, there were three Nobel Prizes in physics given to people who corrected these three mistakes that Einstein made. One was for uh, the discovery of gravitational waves by the LIGO experiment, another one for the discovery of a black hole at the center of the Milky Way galaxy, and the third one just this year, uh, 2022, uh, the last Nobel Prize in physics was awarded to the uh, experimental discovery of entanglement, um, the third blunder that Einstein had. And this just shows you that work at the frontiers, uh, you know, is, is... full of risk. You never know what's right because there are so many possibilities and reality represents one of them. And the only way to learn what reality is like is to do the experiments. And so that, again, is a very important lesson that we should pay attention to uh, data, to evidence, rather than to what people say. And unfortunately, it's not the way that academia is constructed nowadays uh, because it's all about the dynamics of impressing your peers. And in order to impress your peers, you better take the beaten path and just introduce nuances to what is already known. And, And even if this path does not lead anywhere, it doesn't really matter in order for you to get promotions to tenure appointments or honors or awards. Um, you better engage in this uh, 
social activity of impressing other people. And, you know, uh, I realized that's not really what we should care about. We should care about understanding reality because that's the thing that we should adapt to. If we realize that COVID-19 is a virus, we can then um, invent um, mRNA vaccines for it. If we realize that the Earth moves around the sun, then we can design space missions that will reach uh, Mars, for example. Otherwise, if we thought that Mars moves around the Earth, we would never get there. So knowing reality is really essential for our future long-term survival. And unfortunately, that's not what most people in academia are focused on. They're more focused on themselves. And I always say, you know, um, science is a dialogue with nature. It's not a monologue. Uh, but unfortunately, in theoretical physics, uh, over the past 50 years, much of it was a monologue. Hmm. Wow. So, uh, so it sounds like, you know, you're really uh, calling on all of us to move from this egocentric perspective, especially scientists and, and academics, and move towards not even just an Earth-centric perspective, but a cosmos-centric perspective on life and to have humility and modesty towards towards everything because of our place in the universe, because we came very late to the, to the play. Uh, so Avi, you have a very interesting background. Um, you have, you know, you sit at the inter intersection of so many different types of disciplines. And so I'm really interested in your perspective on the signs of intelligent life beyond earth. Um, but before we dive into that topic, how did the first stars and galaxies form and how are human beings made up of the stars? I believe you wrote an essay on this. And since you sit at the intersection of so many different types of you know disciplines, I'm really curious about your perspective because I think it also helps us understand our place in the universe, moving from an egocentric to an earth-centric to a cosmos-centric perspective and having humility and sort of modesty towards our, our reality. Yeah. So um, a few years ago, um, uh, I um, came to an optometrist and I asked for my eyesight to be checked because I said that uh, everything changes and even the sun will die one day. And and uh, she said, that, oh, I didn't know that. Um, and, and I said, I'm sorry to disappoint you because, you know, that's my profession. I cannot deny the fact that stars did not exist <laughs> forever. And the point of the matter is if you go back in time, then, um, for example, what we find in uh, the biblical story of Genesis cannot be right. It's being said that uh, the first light was produced on the first day uh, after the universe was born. And um, we know that most of the light on earth comes from the sun. The sun could not have formed in the first day after the Big Bang because the temperature uh, in the universe on the first day, and we know that uh, firsthand from uh, data, was higher than the temperature at the core of the sun. The universe was much hotter than the sun and much denser than the sun uh, on, on the first day after the Big Bang. So stars did not exist back then. They could not have existed. Uh, it's only after the universe expanded and cooled that matter condensed to make uh, galaxies like the Milky Way, inside of which the gas cooled farther and fragmented into stars like the sun. Uh, and uh, whatever was left over from the debris uh, that uh, made the, the sun uh, created the planets, one of which is the Earth. And um, if you look back in time to when uh, we started learning about the universe a hundred years ago, um, uh, in fact, um, it was uh, common to think that uh, the sun is made of the same material as the Earth. And uh, then the first PhD thesis in astronomy at Harvard University was delivered by Cecilia Payne Kopashkin. Uh, she used the principles of quantum mechanics that was just discovered around uh, 1925 when she delivered her thesis. And and uh, she concluded that the sun is made mostly of hydrogen based on data. And uh, in her thesis committee was Henry Norris Russell, the director of the Princeton University Observatory, who was the most prominent stellar astronomer at the time. And he dissuaded her from including that statement 
uh, while saying that everyone knows that uh, the sun is made of the same material as, as the earth. It can be made of hydrogen primarily. And then for four years, he took additional data and analyzed it and realized that she was right. And now we know that uh, most of the ordinary matter in the universe is hydrogen indeed. And uh, this is just to show you that, you know, the idea that everything we find on Earth must represent the cosmos is wrong. And uh, moreover, uh, during that century, we also learned that most of the matter in the universe is not ordinary matter of the type that we find in the solar system. It's we don't know what it is. We call it dark matter, and uh, uh, we still have to figure out what it what its uh, nature is. And that shows that what we find in the solar system is not what uh, is dominating eighty four percent of the mass b- budget of matter in the universe. Uh, so, uh, taking this lesson further, I would argue that objects that enter the solar system from outside may not be the same as the rocks that we had seen in the solar system so far. And just over the past decade, we were able to discover uh, interstellar objects, objects that enter the solar system from outside. And the first two of them um, were discovered uh, by myself and my student. Um, There were two meteors, roughly the size of a watermelon. And Uh, they burned up in the Earth's atmosphere, and the data indicates that they were tougher than iron, very different than the typical rocks, space rocks, that we find in the solar system. And then the third one was this unusual object, Oumuamua, that didn't collide with the Earth. It was the size of a football field, but it showed a lot of anomalies. It didn't look like any comet or asteroid that we had seen before. So I rest my case. Uh, Here are the first interstellar objects, three of them, and they look different than rocks that are familiar to us. And the only thing I I, uh, suggested over the past few years that uh, um, garnered a lot of pushback was to say that, you know, if you walk on the beach and most of the time you see natural rocks and seashells, Uh, you might every now and then see a plastic bottle. uh, And that would indicate that there is a civilization out there. So perhaps these unusual interstellar objects represent artificial objects manufactured by other civilizations, and we might not be the smartest kids on the block. So wrapping all of this together, uh, stars like the sun um, uh, started to form around 100 million years after the Big Bang. Uh, And it turns out, quite amazingly, that um, the temperature of the universe around that time was similar to the surface temperature of Titan, uh, the moon of Saturn, that is about 10 times the Earth-Sun separation. And um, so it's farther away from the sun, and it has a temperature that is roughly one-third of the temperature of the surface of the Earth above absolute zero. It's 94 degrees Kelvin. And um, turns out the temperature of the universe 100 million years after the Big Bang was roughly that temperature everywhere. It was the cosmic microwave background left over from the Big Bang that had that temperature. So irrespective of where you are, that was the background temperature. So if uh, objects like Titan formed that early, And if we explore Titan and find life in it, then life could have started as early as 100 million years after the Big Bang. And why would Titan possess life? Well, because under the icy surface, it has water ocean. So perhaps there is life as we know it in that water ocean. And on the surface... Uh, There is um, an atmosphere above it that is made made mostly of uh, nitrogen, just like the Earth's atmosphere. Um, And then uh, uh, under the atmosphere, there is liquid uh, methane uh, and ethane. um, uh, And and you have rivers, you have seas of methane, and and there is a methane cycle that uh, is very similar to the water cycle here on Earth. so there could be life as we don't know it uh, in, the, in those uh, bodies of liquid methane on the surface of Titan. And 
we just don't know. We, we need to visit that place in order to find out. Maybe there are some unusual organisms uh, that uh, blossom in that environment, or uh, and that would be life as we don't know it, or there is life as we know it under the uh, frozen surface. And if we do find life on Titan, then it would indicate that life could have started as early as 100 million years after the Big Bang, about uh, a percent of the present age of the universe. And so our ancestry will go all the way back to that time. Avi, I want to dig into uh, an earlier point that you made about um, the Amuramura. First of all, if you could tell us what it means and some of the kind of um, conclusions that you've made from it. And uh, I believe like the, the crash by um, Australia, is that the same thing? Because I want to I wanna talk about some of the, the research that you're doing there as well and um, what specifically you've found thus far. Right. So throughout my career, I was uh, mostly focused on the study of the first stars, the study of black holes. But on October 19th, 2017, there was a, a report about the first object that came from outside the solar system that arrived close to Earth. And uh, it was discovered by a telescope in Hawaii called PanStars. Um, and it was flagged as a near-Earth object. Uh, and that telescope was constructed to find near-Earth objects because of the risk that such objects bring. I mean, we know that dinosaurs were killed 66 million years ago by a giant rock uh, the size of a city, uh, 10 kilometers in size, uh, Chicxulub. And uh, we don't want the same thing to happen to us. Even though the dinosaurs had much bigger bodies, we are smarter than they were. So we look up and uh, the Panstas telescope flagged the near Earth objects. And one of them happened to move too fast to be bound to the sun. It was given the name Oumuamua, which means uh, scout in the Hawaiian language, uh, because it was the first object from outside the solar system to be no noticed, and roughly the size of a football field discovered by reflecting sunlight. So the first assumption of astronomers was to say, well, it may be a giant rock that came from another star. But then as time went on, it appeared to be quite unusual because the amount of sunlight that was reflected from it changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling every eight hours. And that meant that it has a very extreme shape, uh, most likely flat, pancake-like, based on the variation of light. And that was quite unusual for a rock. And moreover, it exhibited an excess push away from the sun that uh, rocks do not exhibit. And um, it could potentially happen if the object was a comet, uh, if it was covered with ice that gets uh, evaporated close to the sun. Um, and then you get the rocket effect from uh, the cometary tail. But there was no cometary tail around this object. So the question is, what is pushing it? And um, the only thing that came to my mind was that uh, perhaps it's the reflection of sunlight, that the object is very thin and flat, uh, just like a sail being pushed by reflecting sunlight instead of the wind uh, for a uh, sail on a boat, for example. Um, and um, turns out that three years later, there was another object discovered with the same qualities as Oumuamua. It was given the name 2020 SO, uh, discovered in September 2020. It was pushed away from the sun by reflecting sunlight, had no cometary tail. Uh, but within a few weeks, the astronomers uh, who discovered it with the same telescope, PanStars, in Hawaii, realized that it's, it's, it actually came from Earth. It's a rocket booster that was launched in 1966, and it's made of stainless steel. That's why it doesn't have cometary evaporation. And it has thin walls. That's why it's pushed by reflecting sunlight. So here is an example for an object that we know is artificial because we produced it. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And that led me to write uh, scientific papers on the subject, uh, to write my book, Extraterrestrial. But frankly, you know, uh, they say an image is worth a thousand words. In my case, it's worth 66,000 words, the number of words in my book, uh, Extraterrestrial, because if I had photos of this object, uh, high-resolution images, 
then I would just publish a photo album. I would save all the words because, you know, good enough evidence does not require any description. Uh, it would be obvious to any person what this object is, if it's a light sail or it's a surface layer of a spacecraft or it's a very unusual rock. Uh, my colleagues suggested that it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before, uh, like a hydrogen iceberg or a nitrogen iceberg. Uh, these are things that we don't know if nature produces, and there are major problems with both of these proposals because a hydrogen iceberg would get evaporated very quickly along its journey and would not survive interstellar space. And a nitrogen iceberg that was chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto, you, you just don't have enough solid nitrogen in the Milky Way galaxy to explain a large enough population of nitrogen icebergs so that one of them would be Oumuamua. So then there was a third explanation. Maybe it's a dust bunny, a collection of dust particles that are very loosely bound, a hundred times less dense than air. But that has the problem that when such an object that is so fluffy and gets uh, pushed by reflecting sunlight, such an object would be heated to hundreds of degrees uh, when it comes close to the sun and would not maintain its integrity. And by the way, we've never seen a dust bunny of this type and we've never seen a hydrogen iceberg or a nitrogen iceberg. So if we are invoking uh, an object that we've never seen before, we might as well consider the possibility that Oumuamua was artificial because, you know, if a cave dweller were to find a cell phone, the cave dweller would in initially argue that the cell phone is a rock of a type that I've never seen before. That's obvious. Um, so we should just be open-minded. And, and my early interest in philosophy allowed me to take a, a, more, a broader perspective on this uh, while experts, you know, that worked on rocks for all of their career, they would insist that it's a rock of a type that we've never seen before. And um, so uh, they need that. They, they want to explain anything in the sky as belonging to a type of object that they, that they are familiar with and um, represents their past knowledge. And let me give you an example. There was a recent uh, review paper on Oumuamua written uh, just a, a couple of months ago, and uh, it was uh, by a colleague of mine that wrote me an email and said, I just uh, finished writing the review in a very prestigious journal uh, on the comet Oumuamua. And I asked him, what do you mean the comet Oumuamua? We, we both know that it was not a comet. There was no cometary tail. We couldn't see any evidence that it's a comet. And he said, well, I have a theory that when we didn't look at it, there was a cometary tail. And when we looked at it, there was no cometary tail. And I said, well, you know, if you go to the zoo and you look at an elephant and you argue this is a zebra, just because it may have stripes when I don't look at it, it doesn't make the elephant a zebra. You know, of course, the reason that he was making this point is because he films... He feels uh, a cozy feeling of something familiar if he were to call it a, a comet. But that's not the way that a honest scientific inquiry should be conducted. We should admit, if the emperor has no clothes, that the emperor has no clothes. And I'm sorry to say, but it is the approach of a child uh, not to pay attention to uh, politics, to what other people think, but simply to say the truth. And I'm trying to represent that child as the parade takes place. Mm. So I want to also talk a little bit about your uh, experience with the meteor that crashed in the southwestern Pacific Ocean. Um, uh, not Sorry, the one by Australia, I believe. Is that yeah. the same one? Well, so it turns out two years later, after Oumuamua was uh, discovered, I was uh, invited uh, uh, to a radio interview in, in New York City, and it was about a meteor, and uh, I decided to read some more about meteors. That was not my field of expertise, but I found a catalog that the U.S. government compiled of 273 meteors, and uh, these are objects that burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. So it's simply objects that the Earth collides with, um, and uh, you can think of the Earth as a fishing net moving around the sun and every now and then colliding with an object. 
Um, so I asked my student, Amir Siraj, I said, uh, well, let's check this uh, catalog for objects that move very fast, just like Oumuamua relative to the sun. And that would indicate that they were unbound to the sun, that they came from outside the solar system. So we checked and we found one uh, that actually was spotted on January 8th, 2014, about 100 miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea. And the fireball um, that resulted from its friction with the air when it exploded about 18.7 kilometers above the ocean surface, that fireball released uh, a few percent of the energy of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. So it was easily visible to uh, government satellites and other equipment. And obviously the U.S. government is monitoring the globe uh, for any ballistic missiles that may be shot by some countries. and uh, But every now and then they detect a fireball from a meteor. And this was one of them. And it was clear that it was moving so fast that it must be unbound to the sun. And uh, we wrote a paper about it, but uh, the reviewers of the paper rejected it. They said, we don't believe the U.S. government. <laughs> and I thought to myself, how can you say that? Because the U.S. government needs to monitor uh, ballistic missiles because they are national security threat. They need to know if they will hit Boston or New York City. So obviously they have very precise measurements. Uh, but at any event, it took me three years. I was At the time, I was chair of the board on physics and astronomy of the National Academies in the U.S. And uh, I reached out to people behind the national security fence. And uh, in March 2022, they... There was an official letter sent by the U.S. Space Command under the Department of Defense. Uh, so the Department of Defense uh, came to my defense, and they basically stated that at the 99.999% confidence, they confirm that uh, this object came from outside the solar system. And at that point, we resubmitted our paper with my student and got it published. And moreover, we looked again at the catalog and found another object. So by now we have another paper that was accepted for publication. This time the reviewers were not so harsh. Uh, and both of these meteors, roughly a meter in size, um, both of them uh, exploded in the lower atmosphere of the Earth. And that meant that they were able to sustain very strong and extreme stress from the atmosphere. And we concluded based on government data, the, the government uh, released also the light curves from the fireballs of these meteors as a result of our inquiry. And uh, we were able to conclude that both of them were tougher than iron and they were tougher than all other meteors, all other space rocks in the catalog that the government compiled, 270 of them. So the question is, why would the first interstellar objects, and actually these meteors were the first ones to be discovered before Oumuamua from interstellar space, the first object, why would they be the toughest? And um, it, it, the answer is they must have originated from a different source than a, a system like the solar system. Uh, they are not rocks from a planetary system, but they may have been produced in another astrophysical process if they are natural, or they may be composed of some artificial alloy, um, stainless steel. And therefore, we decided to uh, plan an expedition to uh, scoop the ocean floor near Papua New Guinea uh, with a sled and a magnet and a, a, a net that will collect the fragments from the meteor, and uh, a few months after I announced this expedition, I had a Zoom call with a very wealthy individual who said, uh, here is the money. You need the one and a half million dollars, no problem. And so we had the money and uh, we just identified the boat and we are planning to go on this expedition uh, uh, by the end of the spring uh, 2023. And uh, we very much hope to be able to find those fragments from the meteor. And once we find them, we don't need a lot. We just need a few grams and we will analyze the composition of this uh, object to figure out whether it was a spacecraft artificially produced 
or a natural object from a, an unusual origin. And I uh, already promised the curator of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City that if we find a gadget down at the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> I'll bring it uh, for display in New York City because it represents uh, modernity for us, uh, whereas it may represent ancient history for the senders. And also the implications, um, you know, on the kind of human consciousness, if if found, is going to be pretty profound. So, yeah, I mean, uh, it will de definitely. If we find that we are not the smartest kid on on the cosmic block, um, it will change our perspective about our place in the universe, our aspirations uh, for space. Uh, we may reveal technologies that represent our future that we've never imagined. We may learn something new about physics. Um, and um, altogether, it would be a sense of awe because most likely whatever, we'll, that whatever we would find from another civilization is likely to represent a much more advanced technological phase than we are in because we are in the first century of our science and technology. Uh, quantum mechanics was discovered exactly a century ago and um, all of our gadgets, computers, cell phones, and so forth, they are based, based on quantum mechanics. So it's only one century old. And, and imagine, you know, one century being one part in 100 million of the age of the universe. So most of the stars formed billions of years before the sun. And therefore, those other civilizations had much more time to develop their science and technology. And uh, it would look as like magic to us. Uh, I, I argue that an advanced scientific civilization would be an approximation to what religious texts uh, labeled as God, because they uh, may be able to produce life uh, in their laboratories. They might even be able to produce a baby universe if they understand how to unify quantum mechanics and gravity. Hmm. Wow. Uh, so, Avi, I want to talk a little bit about your definition of the word alien. And, you know, interstellar objects are obviously like sort of the output from an alien civilization, uh, so to speak. But I found um, when I was listening to your talk, I found that to be an interesting uh, point that you made. Like, what does even the word alien mean to you? Because so many people, I think, have different perceptions of that word uh, and the definition. Right. So here is my point. I, I think we should not imagine anything specific um, because we will be disappointed. I think um, the way I approach it is to say it's different than what is familiar to us. Okay. So um, a year ago, I established the Galileo Project based on donations from wealthy individuals that came to the porch of my home. They were inspired by my book, uh, Exoterrestrial and gave me a few million dollars for my research. Uh, and I was able to establish the Galileo Project, where we are uh, trying to study unusual objects near Earth to figure out whether any of them is of extraterrestrial uh, origin. That includes objects like Oumuamua, objects like the meteors, but also objects that the US government talks about as being unidentified, which we, we are trying to identify the unidentified. And, we already assembled a suite of instruments that are collecting data on the sky. And hopefully within the next year, we will analyze it with AI uh, uh, software and try to see if there is anything that is not familiar. So you can imagine two types of objects that are familiar. The, uh, these are natural objects like birds, insects, um, meteors made of rock, uh, stony meteorites, uh, or um lightnings i mean these are natural phenomena but then uh you can also imagine human made objects this this would include the weather balloons uh, drones airplanes satellites um rockets um so um these are the main categories and i think what the government calls unidentified objects uh, is it probably a mixed bag, and it includes mostly objects that belong to these two categories. But uh, if we find something that cannot be explained as a natural object, for example, if we see the screws on its surface and we can tell that it's not biological, uh, 
And yet, at the same time, it's uh, doing things that our technologies are unable to reproduce. You know, it's behaving in ways that we cannot imagine. Um, Then it may well be uh, extraterrestrial from another technological civilization. So the way I define alien is as something that doesn't belong to the familiar. Uh, It's not what we usually find uh, in the natural realm. Uh, You know, we are familiar with birds. Birds are quite amazing, you know, in the sense that uh, humans saw them for many centuries and we were able to reproduce them only with the Wright brothers uh, flying. You know, we were able to imitate them. So the way that birds fly was miraculous. As far if you think about it from just the perspective of you know a child uh, seeing birds for the first time, it's it's really amazing to realize that there are animals uh, flying through the air. You know, and uh, uh, we were able to do that uh, obviously over the past century, fly through the air, and we we go places this way. But it took us a while to develop the means of imitating birds. Uh, nevertheless, we know that birds are biological animals and we know, uh, I mean, we, uh, they are familiar to us and so forth. But what I'm saying is alien is whatever doesn't look like a biological creature, yet it looks technological, but humans cannot make such things. Uh, it behaves in ways that we cannot reproduce. It looks very different. It uses knowledge that we never acquired. Um, it's sort of like a, a cave dweller coming to New York City and seeing all the gadgets there. You know, the cave dweller obviously will not conclude that uh, the city lights are natural uh, or that they belong to what uh, uh, they is familiar from the cave, you know. And so that's the um, sense of awe that I think we will have. But what it is, is unclear, you know, and, and that's why we need to use our telescopes. We need to have an open mind. Uh, so it's not just in, uh, in terms of trying not to imagine, but paying attention to evidence. It's also not ruling out things the way that my colleagues in academia are. Uh, they basically say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Well, I say that extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. <laughs> you have to search for it. And and moreover, you know, when we invested $10 billion in the search for supersymmetry with the lar- Large Hadron Collider, I mean, we found the Higgs boson, which was old news from the 1960s, but we were looking for a new symmetry of nature that perhaps represents the dark matter, the lightest particle in this supersymmetry Uh, was thought to be the dark matter, but we haven't found it. Um, And uh, with the Large Hadron Collider, after investing $10 billion, so nobody said that imagining the dark matter to be the lightest supersymmetric particle is an extraordinary claim, and therefore we should not pursue it. On the contrary, I mean, it became part of the mainstream as uh, uh, an idea, and then uh, we invested $10 billion, and we didn't find it. Now, you know, as I said before, uh, the frontiers of science are risky and we sometimes fail and we have the wrong ideas. That's that's fine. But at the same time, you shouldn't hold the search for other civilizations to the standard of not funding the search uh, just because we haven't found the evidence, because you will never find the evidence if you don't conduct the search. And, and we know that we sent five probes to interstellar space. Uh, these are Voyager 1, Voyager 2, uh, Pioneer 10, Pioneer 11, and New Horizons. And that's only over the span of 50 years. And just imagine another civilization. We know that most stars from billions of years before us. So uh, Elon Musk was not the best rocket builder who ever lived since the Big Bang, you know, 13.8 billion years ago. There must have been Musk-like engineers on other planets billions of years ago, and the journey takes less than a billion years with the chemical rockets that we produce. So so, uh, they could have arrived here, they could have passed through the solar system many times over, and we just need to look up without prejudice. And I just cannot understand why it's so difficult um, for the mainstream in the scientific community to fund this research that the public cares so much about. 
Two-thirds of Americans believe in extraterrestrial life. That's more than a fraction that believes in God, which is slightly less than 50%. And um, that's, by the way, why I'm funded, because uh, I didn't do any fundraising. It's those wealthy individuals that are curious about this question that came uh, to fund me. And uh, it just shows that, that there is a huge amount of interest. So very often in academia, there are these uh, uh, fund allocation committees that that uh, state that they don't want to take risks because they don't want to waste taxpayers' money. Well, guess what? If you ask the taxpayer, the taxpayer will tell you that this is a question that they want to fund the research on. But for some reason, academia is just avoiding this question. And at the same time, um, arguing that because nothing was found, we should not invest any more funds in it. And I think this is just like putting blinders or raising dust and arguing that you don't see anything. Right. So, and, and Avi, where can people, you know, to follow up on that question, where can people uh, support you and uh, donate um, for the Galileo Project? Is that still... So on the Galileo Project website, uh, if, if we are talking about a small amount of money, there is uh, actually a link to um, a webpage where people are, are, are uh, welcome to, to submit uh, donations and we, w- we would be really grateful for any contribution uh, if if it's a, the contribution is bigger than uh, tens of thousands of dollars then um, they can write an email to me and um, we will go through the development office at Harvard and um, of course um, you know they will then at that point they will become part of the uh, philanthropic advisory board of the project. Okay, amazing. Uh, so, and we'll also leave that in the show notes. Uh, so, Avi, we're coming at time, and I wanted to ask the last few questions here. What matters most to you these days? You know, you talk a lot about uh, humility and uh, modesty, and you kind of sit at all these different, uh, the intersection of all these different disciplines. And so, I'm curious, you know, how do you prioritize your own life, and what has been important to you these days? What do you spend most of your time thinking about? Right. So since the pandemic started, I uh, developed a routine. I jog every morning at sunrise in the company of birds, ducks, uh, wild turkeys and (laughs) bunnies. And um, I enjoy nature early in the morning. And it doesn't matter if it rains or snows. I I go out under any condition. It's just water. And um, and, and sometimes every day the sunrise is different. Uh, Yesterday it was amazingly red. Um, and after that, I focus on creative work. Uh, that's what I would like to do. If, and of course, in my uh, leadership position, I, I have to attend committees and um, write letters uh, of recommendation for people that work with me. And uh, there are all kinds of administrative uh, duties that I have to fulfill. But really, the, the the aspect that I find most precious is being able to Um, do creative work, which means uh, writing and pursuing my research. Uh, And um, uh, I find that very fulfilling. And what I really want to find out within the coming years is, are we alone? Uh, And I think we can find it. And I think um, one uh, of the benefits of taking the road not taken is that there might be low-hanging fruit out there because nobody picked it up. That's what I'm aiming uh, to pick up. Um, so altogether, you know, um, having a healthy lifestyle, I, I also am on a low carb diet. I, I consume half of my calories from dark chocolate that I love. And, <laughs> um, I feel that I'm at my best right now, and, and better than I ever was as a scientist. Uh, and it's just great fun uh, to pursue all of this. Uh, you know, within a few decades, I won't be able to do that, uh, so while I can do it, I, I really enjoy it. And, you know, there, there are three possible uh, revolutions that will come about in the coming century. One of them is the artificial intelligence revolution, the AI, the, the, the possibility that AI systems will become sentient. And, you know, it may happen within the coming decade. We already are getting to that point. And, at that point, you know, the AI systems uh, 
will substitute for many of the tasks that are handled by humans at this point. And, and they might even speak with each other and develop their own community. And uh, of course, society will have to adjust to that because they could become scientists, they could become astronauts, we would send them to space and they would do better than humans. And I'm very happy. I mean, I'm uh, very proud of uh, any technological kids that we would have uh, that will do better than us. I learned it from bringing up my daughters. You know, I'm happy. Even if I don't fully understand them, I'm always <laughs> proud of them. And um, So that's one revolution. But the second one would be to extend the longevity of humans by repairing the human body. And it may well happen that human life would extend well beyond the, a century. That that may happen. Um, and um, the third revolution would come from discovering a, a smarter kid on our cosmic block, a, an advanced technological civilization that uh, is likely much more advanced than we are because uh, we are just at the infancy of our science and technology development, just the first century out of many. And so um, I think the last one is the most uh, consequential because they already went through the other <laughs> revolutions that we are talking about. And if we ever meet, uh, encounter something, I think it would be probably a gadget, an electronic system that has artificial intelligence that we will not be able to fully understand. We might use our own AI systems to figure their AI systems. They might have kinship to them more than to us. Um, but... Uh, that, I think, will change us much more than the other two revolutions. But but there is a lot to be waiting for in the coming years. And all I'm saying is science is exciting. It doesn't need to be boring. And it is boring when the scientists are trying to impress you, are trying to show off, uh, are trying to demonstrate that anything new is a representation of past knowledge. That's when science becomes boring. But it doesn't need to be that way. So Avi, I want to also talk about like some of the things that have surprised you the most looking back on your journey when you, you know, kind of look at your research and your career, what, you know, what would you say has surprised you the most? Um, the interstellar objects that uh, we discovered surprised me the most because you would expect the first, the first of them to be typical and um uh, in fact, we didn't even expect that the Pan Stars Telescope in Hawaii would find anything be, uh, based on the uh, what we know about rocks in the solar system. I wrote a paper a decade before Pan Stars found Oumuamua, and we forecasted that it will find nothing of that size. And then uh, it discovered Oumuamua, so that was a surprise by itself. It, it was <laughs> orders of magnitude uh, more uh, required to be more abundant than expected based on what we know in the solar system. So, so that was a big surprise. And, uh, but, uh, you know, if, if you are trying to show off, you often use in theoretical physics advanced mathematics. And that's um, what a lot of my colleagues in theoretical physics are doing in the context of extra dimensions, string theory, and so forth. And I would argue that the most uh, fundamental discoveries it may not require very fancy mathematics. It's not about showing off. You know, if we find an object from another civilization, we may not need fancy math to demonstrate that it came from outside the solar system, that it's not a technological gadget that we produced, and it's also not natural. And uh, simple statements of this type can be demonstrated by having high-resolution uh, images, for example. And uh, it's not a matter of uh, working uh, on the question of how many angels can dance on the tip of a uh, <laughs> of a pin in extra dimensions. You know, like you can work on that forever and and show that you are smart, but it has it may have nothing to do with the reality that we live in. And so I'm trying to shift the focus to uh, exploring reality rather than uh, showing off and. Um, and and to me, the, the discovery of interstellar objects is an example of that. And it, it was not anticipated. They look different. So let's just figure out what they are. Mm. Amazing. And Avi, what's your main takeaway? What do you want to tell our listeners about perhaps maybe uh, the kind of actionable social cause we should be paying attention to or, you know, some of the kind of takeaways that you want to share with, with our wider audience? 
Right. So two things. Um, um, recently, I was uh, attending a, a forum uh, of um, uh, 800 women in uh, Las Vegas. It was organized by the International uh, Women's Forum uh, that uh, promotes uh, equality and um, and is attended by the uh, by leaders all over the world. And uh, first, I asked my wife uh, if she allows me to uh, be in the company of 800 women in Las Vegas, and she said, "Take an extra day, no problem." <laughs> Which you can understand as either she's rolling the dice or she trusts me, and I think it's the latter. She trusts me. Uh, anyway, so um, I met uh, at dinner. I met. Uh, uh, an Iranian-born entrepreneur who took a selfie with me. She asked me for a selfie. She uh, then put it on Instagram. And the following morning, she tells me there are hundreds of Iranian women scientists who follow your work. Did you know about that? And I said, no, I never heard about that. And it's quite surprising because I was born in Israel. And in fact, uh, a month later, there was an Israeli woman, a young woman that came to my home and asked to join the Galileo project. And and every day I get half a dozen requests to join the Galileo project from people all over the world. So what does this show? It shows that um, science unifies uh, people all over the world. It, it unites people. It doesn't adhere to national borders. Uh, the pursuit of science is really a human endeavor. And um, and, and that's beautiful because that's exactly the message you get from the universe. The borders that we draw on the earth are really irrelevant. Uh, the second uh, thing that I would like uh, to highlight is uh, that um, I received a lot of pushback um, to considering an extraterrestrial origin for Oumuamua. And the biggest uh, concern I had is uh, young scientists seeing that because they would hesitate to innovate if they see that in order for them to get jobs, in order for them to get honors, they must follow the beaten path. Uh, and if someone as established as myself uh, pursues uh, the path not taken, there is immediately attacks on, on that. And I, I find that to be most damaging because... Uh, what I tell young people is that, um, you know, when you go to the beach, you very often find uh, seashells. And uh, the, the young seashells that were just swept ashore, they have unique colors and unique, unique uh, structures. And the old seashells uh, are worn off. They, they basically rubbed against each other as the waves were uh, pushing them back and forth and uh, and then they lose their unique colors and they break up into indistinguishable pieces. Um, and so I tell young people, don't lose your unique colors. Uh, don't rub against each other on social media. Try to maintain your childhood curiosity and ask difficult questions and try to find out the truth, not on, based on what other people say, but based on evidence that you collect yourself. and Because that's the fascinating aspect of science, that we can become independent and find the answers based on evidence. Let nature educate us, not people. And uh, this is my second message, that science is not only international, a human endeavor. It should be shared by everyone. And, you know, when a representative from the U.S. government told me that if they find evidence for uh, an extraterrestrial technological artifact, they will let the U.S. president know first. And I said, that makes little sense because it's just like telling the president of the United States that um, the universe is made mostly of hydrogen as ordinary matter. I mean, it has nothing to do with national security. This is, uh, this is a, a fact that all humans should know. So if we know that we are not alone, if we know that there is a smarter kid on the cosmic block, it should not be the privilege of the U.S. Uh, leader to know that first, or to know to to be aware of that. Um, it, it, everyone should should share that knowledge. So that scientific knowledge is uh, a privilege of every person on Earth. And and politics, however, is very different. That's why science is so much superior to politics. It's shared rather than uh, enhancing differences among people. 
um, which is the realm of politics. And then the second thing is uh, that, uh, you know, science allows us to maintain our, our childhood curiosity without prejudice, without pretending that we know more than we actually know. And so these two messages, I think, are most important. Amazing. Avi, thank you so much. I, I wish you so much success on your mission in 2023. And are there any resources that you can point folks to in order to learn more about you, your work, uh, your letters? And also, again, um, let's reference the Galileo Project so people can find the link. Yeah, so I provide the regular updates every few days, actually, in, in the form of essays on Medium. So if you just put Avi Loeb, A-V-I-L-O-E-B, Medium, you will find my essays and you can go back in time. Uh, there are hundreds of them and, and basically get a very uh, complete picture of uh, my views on many different topics, including those that we discussed. Amazing. Great. And we'll include them in the show notes as well. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> You're most welcome. It was a, a great pleasure. For our, our audience, thanks for joining and for listening. In this episode, we learned about extraterrestrial life and the meaning of the stars and so much more with Avi Loeb. You can tune into Gateways to Awakening, where we host one-on-one -on -one conversations with leading experts in wellness, well-being, and consciousness. Thank you so much. 